Yes, it's been a little while, but by God, it feels good. It feels real good. Let's see if I remember how to do this. It's time for a pay-per-view review. Yeah! Now, before I talk about the actual show, for the love of humanity, like seriously, literally, the love of wrestling humanity, WWE, you have got to do something. And I realize we're probably at the point of no return for here in the distant future. The company believes their big show should be longer, and their biggest show should be longer still. No matter how much we might want to fight that battle and say your shows are too damn long, the reality is that's probably not changing. But for Christ's sakes, WWE, just for the U.S. customers, not even thinking about those in England and Europe or Asia or anything else, can you please keep us in mind a little bit and shake up the way you do your pay-per-view, specifically around the dates? If you are going to insist on having your show run till almost midnight Eastern effing time, then can we stop running these big shows on a Sunday night? You do realize that people just like me all over the country have to get up early to go to work the next freaking day. That is very, very hard to do when you're trying to stay up to watch one of the really big shows and it lasts five damn hours, and that's just the main card. Imagine the saps that actually watched the two hours of Flippin' Pre-Show. Seven hours! It's bad enough you're not respecting our time. Could you at least respect us as working people, as business professionals? There is no reason, no reason, the WWE can't put their takeover shows on Friday night and their pay-per-views on Saturday night. And I know what they're going to say. Well, we like the thought of it's a show, it's a show, it's a show, it's a show when you factor in Raw and SmackDown four days in a row. We don't need that shit. People that are traveling from all over the place that are going to sit there and go to the TakeOver show and go to Royal Rumble are probably going to stick around a day if there was a break to then go to Raw and or SmackDown. I mean, Jesus Christ. Take over on a Friday night, then do your big show on a Saturday night. That way you give your paying customers, your audience, your fans, some space on a Sunday. A little bit of a break. Because I can tell you this much. No matter how good or bad this 2019 Royal Rumble is going to end up being, there is no way, and I mean no way, that I would want to sit there and then watch three hours of Raw the very next night. And then, to top it all off, another two hours of SmackDown on Tuesday night? You must be fucking insane! Hell no! The Royal Rumble is supposed to be the kickoff to WrestleMania season. That should be the thing that makes me actually want to start watching your television product. Not sit there and make me not want to watch it because I have fucking wrestling fatigue. Hell yes, baby, I'm getting old. Shut up. Shut up. But the truth of the matter is, getting old or not, I feel like almost 24 hours later that I still got my ass kicked and I didn't even step in the ring because these shows are way too goddamn long and worst of all on a Sunday night. So you kicked off with Becky Lynch and Asuka, which should have given us an indication right then and there how this match was going to play out. To a degree, to a degree. This match, though, it never felt like it really was for a woman's championship until the very end. Most of the match to me was just a bunch of spots, didn't really mean anything, there was no real consequence, one very interested. The finishing sequence got a little bit better, but then of all the dumb ass things that WWE is going to do, there are so many other ways to have Becky Lynch lose that match and not look like jackasses, and the WWE has this love, and they do it to Nia Jax all the time. They always want to make these people tap out that they shouldn't be having freaking tap out. Have Becky Lynch get pinned via bullshit. Have Becky Lynch get pinned via fluke. Have her get disqualified. Have her get counted out. Have Asuka get disqualified. Do a double disqualification. A double countout. Any number of other damn things 
other than having a person that is sitting there calling themselves the man fucking tap like a bitch. Imagine if you would have done this at WrestleMania 13 with Stone Cold. You would have undercut him. It does no good to talk about being the toughest son of a bitch in WWF if he's tapping out to Bret Hart's sharpshooter. The blood streaming down his face, he passed out, and a legend was created right then and there. You've got this character talking about being the man, and what better way to show you're the man than fucking tap out. That's stupid. When you see Shane McMahon, you see the oversized baseball jersey, you see those weird ass looking punches, the kind of pudgy face. At a certain light, when you see Shane McMahon, he's got this kind of quality about him that he looks like he just came back from finishing third place in some MMA tournament at the fucking Special Olympics. I'm sorry, that's just what it is. That said though, there is something inherently interesting and entertaining about Shane McMahon as a wrestler. He doesn't do it all the time. But the one thing you know about Shane McMahon is that you know what he lacks in wrestling skill and true abilities. He's going to make up with passion, desire, and a willingness to do whatever the fuck he takes. And somehow it almost always finds a way to work. I know usually that means we're just waiting for the Shane no shit spot. Like, oh shit. But it's more than that. It's never pretty. Hardly ever pretty. But somehow his matches usually work. This Mizzo Mac tag team, fucking I'm sold on it. Cool. This tag match to me was infinitely more entertaining than Becky Lynch versus Asuka. As fucked up as that sounds, I'm probably not the only one that thinks that. It was interesting that Ronda Rousey got some booze, and I'm sure it has a lot to do with the reports that she's looking to take a break from WWE soon so she can start a family. Only in the wrestling world would we boo somebody who is married that wants to start a family, but nonetheless, that's what it is. Sasha Banks, Ronda Rousey, Raw Women's Championship. It was sloppy at times, and frankly, sometimes it was ugly. It was like this weird balance of sloppy and very good. It can be sloppy and yet still feel good. Kind of like that thought pussy that you nailed the other week. You get what I'm saying? You don't really feel much in terms of the walls, but if you wait it a little bit, you still find a way to bust a nut. That's what it is. This match was ugly, but it really worked. It was really weird how all this deal being paid to Sasha Banks and Ronda Rousey and their ability to make people submit. It added, ended the match via pinfall. That was odd. All that told me is that Sasha Banks is much better in terms of backstage politics than Becky Lynch. Ugly, but good. Like I said, like a thought pussy. You don't want to see a lot of them like this, but every once in a while, it's okay. You know what I mean? tweeted during the Becky Lynch and Asuka match, talking about when you factor in entrances and just the match themselves, that it should generally be like sex. All the foreplay, which you can classify as the entrances and so forth, for the most part, 15 minutes should be enough to get the job done. And if you get to that point of 15 minutes and nobody's ready to nut, or one of you isn't really ready to nut, then maybe it's time to take a pause and revisit later. You can't figure it out by then. It probably isn't going to happen. And even if it does, you've put forth too much effort. It's just unnecessary. So you can imagine my great joy at the fact that the longest match of the night was this god-awful Women's Royal Rumble match. It was over an hour and ten minutes, I think it was. God. This was bad, dull, boring as shit for the vast majority of it. Now look... Stand, there are many that like all these NXT people being a part of the Rumble. Cool, okay, showcase for them. But like for me, somebody who doesn't watch NXT, I don't know who half these people are, nor do I care who half of these people are. It's a trade-off. You're giving these people some exposure, but you're missing some of the spice of having some of the names of the past be out there. And it was clearly evident 
Like you had a couple of women that had a little bit of star power and mattered and everybody else just did not. You know, it's sad when the single biggest thing I popped for during the first 98% of this Rumble match was the appearance of Hornswoggle chasing Ron Selena Vega. I mean, I legit popped, as I should have. The guy that once got pushed more than 95% of the WWE roster was there, and I enjoyed the hell out of it. What I didn't enjoy the hell out of, though, was when they did the spot with Becky Lynch, and she fucked up and sold the wrong knee. First you start off with the right knee, and then you start off with the left knee. I hope Botchamania destroys them for this shit. And how stupid. You should be able to see in the production truck that she started off holding her right knee. Now she's holding her left knee. So we're going to go back to the replay that shows her initially holding her right knee. How stupid can you be? If I can catch it real time when I'm not getting fucking paid for it, Kevin Dunn, what's up, Doc? And everybody else back there in the production crew should have caught that shit too and been like, hey, maybe we should cut off the replay at a certain point or maybe not show it at all so that way we don't look like jackasses. Jackasses. You know, like having somebody talk about being the man and yet you have her tap out just so that way she could come in after Lana can't go, be the 30th entrant, and then win the damn Royal Rumble. Now on the surface, it's like, good, great, the man's going to get a main event type match at WrestleMania, perhaps in the main event against somebody like Ronda Rousey, cool. But you also know based on the way they did it, because the WWE, those idiots have fucking booked themselves into a goddamn box. They're going to find a way to squeeze Charlotte in, because that's what this company likes to fucking do. Fuck Charlotte. Tired of seeing her ass. She sucks. I don't give a shit. She's boring as bricks. If her last name wasn't Flair, all of you would fucking agree. You don't agree. Kiss my ass. Becky winning was the right decision. The fucking up of selling the wrong knee sucks. The fact that she tapped out an hour plus before that, and now we're supposed to believe she's the man again, sucked. The women's rumble match sucked. You know shows are too long when a match featuring AJ Styles and Daniel Bryan for the WWE Championship go on after a Women's Royal Rumble match and gets largely crickets. And it wasn't even about the crowd. This match just didn't work. You're just coming off of this hour plus long match with the realization you still got half the damn show to go. These guys were in an, in an enviable position and they didn't do well with it. It happens sometimes. But it was slow, it was dull, it just never clicked, it just never got going, it just didn't work. And then Eric Rowan? Eric Rowan? Eric Rowan? We're going to do some retarded-ass reverse Wyatt family here with Daniel Bryan at the hell? Oh! The storyline we're talking about in a match involving AJ Styles and Daniel Bryan for the WWE Championship is ever growing! That summed up this night perfectly! God, I couldn't wait to get on here and talk about this match. Like, if there was one thing I was really looking forward to with the thought of doing a Royal Rumble review was being in full locked and loaded engage mode, getting ready to blast all over Finn Balor versus Brock Lesnar for the Universal title. I couldn't wait. And then when I see Finn Balor is just looking like Finny the Twink, there's no fucking demon page. One of the two redeeming qualities a jackass has, I'm like, oh God, this is going to suck. I already don't care about Finn Balor. Most certainly don't care about Brock Lesnar. Why the hell would I care about this title match? I can't wait for this monstrosity of a joke to be over where they either make Finn Balor look like way too much of a threat or they make Brock Lesnar look like a fucking beast and easily dispatch him and everybody's crying about how much of a waste of fucking time this match was. I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait. And then the match started. There's only one way it feels like this match could really go where it could work for somebody as jaded as me. And they made it work. This match worked. 
It wasn't super duper freaking long. It was the perfect type of title match where I felt like I got what I needed. Could have had some more, but glad that we didn't. Just because a match could go longer doesn't mean a match needs to or should go longer. The way they work this, where you're selling it like Finn Balor had studied Lesnar from the beginning and he knew the only chance he had was to hit him with superior quickness and explosiveness. And that's what he did from the jump. And he still had Lesnar looking powerful. But then, the most believable spot of the entire night, when Lesnar goes into the corner of the table, like everybody, just think about the corner of a table or an edge of a table hitting you in your belly button region. Especially when you've got the commentators reminding you about his previous history with diverticulitis. Like, you can feel that. You talk about it in fight, the fighting world all the time. You want to soften somebody up, work their core, work their stomach, work their abs. It made sense. It's really hard to kick ass if you're having trouble with your midsection, your core, especially if you're having trouble drawing in oxygen. Brock, I thought, did a fantastic job of selling it. I thought the way they structured this match really worked. And I was pleasantly surprised. Of all the things I expected to be pleased by on this damn show, Finn Balor versus Brock Lesnar was not what I was expecting at all. This to me is easily, easily Finn Balor's best match on the WWE main roster. You can at me all you want as the fucking Twitter heads say, I don't care. You take all these other meaningless matches that he's been involved with and shove them up your ass. This is a big four pay-per-view against a guy like Brock. And Finn came out of this looking good. All the while, Lester didn't look that stupid. They took a really bad situation and I thought made the best of it. I actually applaud the WWE for how this whole match was put together because it worked. And it's kind of thrown me off my game because I don't know what else to bitch about. Mercifully, almost four hours into the main card, we finally get to the main event. The Men's Royal Rumble match. At this point in time, I need anything as a bit of a pick-me-up, to ensure that I don't fall asleep during this motherfucker. Elias out number one! I'm gonna get a performance! You know what? Okay! This could work. I can make it. So I'm telling myself, I can make it. The WWE can't screw this up. The WWE wouldn't screw this up. The WWE wouldn't dare screw this up! Bad enough. God trolls me. And I'm gonna you have to too! Entry number two. Entry number two. Hall of Fame, now that he's in it, it is once 
and for all the Hall of Fucking Lanes, 10,000 guitars broken, zero times drawn. Fuck that Memphis mid-card piece of shit. I'm gonna sell you gold bars. I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do a whole lot of nothing except draw no goddamn money. No goddamn money. But yet, still, people insist in trolling me with this. I think this is good. This is not good. This is not healthy. Fuck each and every one of you that wanted this. Fuck each and every one of you that wanted me to react like this. And most importantly, let's pursue it all once again. Fuck Jack Jack. Well, I guess WWE wanted to give me some wake up juice. And by God, they did. Cause I didn't go to bed till like three o'clock in the morning. I had to get up at six thirty because I was so fucking angry and so jacked up about the fact that they wasted a precious commodity of a rumble spot on that slap nuts. Unbelievable, just unbelievable. But really, when you talk about the rest of this rumble match, and sure, part of it maybe was fatigue. But a lot of it was just kind of the ebb and flow of this show. This actual rumble match was really lacking. It was pretty lame. Let's just be honest. Especially when I think most people realize that two of the absolute favorites here were Braun Strowman and Seth Rollins. And they spent a large portion of their time outside of the ring. Like, they got a little bit of shine, but then they were gone for extended periods of time. And to me, that's just kind of lazy. And it doesn't work, it doesn't help, and it doesn't build up to the big moment where you ultimately know you're going to get down to these final two. Really, truly, to me, the highlight of the Men's Royal Rumble was Nia Jax taking out R-Truth and entering in at number 30. For those knuckleheads, for those idiots that sit there and say the WWE was wrong for having a woman enter the Royal Rumble more specifically having dudes attack and assault her and hit their finishing moves on her. The bitch held her own for a few minutes. She's bigger than most of the men in the damn match. She eliminated somebody. You know, equality means it's equal across the board. That's what it's supposed to mean. And in a society where we teach men it's wrong to hit women, but we teach women it's okay to strike men and frankly we applaud them when they do it and we laugh our asses off at them when they smack a dude. The fuck is wrong with her going into a ring, holding her own, and the guys responding? Now nah, fuck that shit. If you got a problem with that, you can kiss my fucking ass. You fucking snowflakes want to talk about women empowerment and you want to talk about this feminazi bullshit. Well, here's the true example of they had Nia Jax enter in at number 30 in a featured spot in the Rumble, and they gave her shine for a few minutes. She eliminated Mustafa Ali, who had been getting pushed here for a little while, and they thought enough of her, whether you want to say it was for ulterior motives or not, to have people like Rey Mysterio and fucking Randy Orton hit signature moves on her. That, if anything, is progress. If you want to complain about Nia Jax being in this match, because you would have liked to have seen people like Adam Cole, Bebe, or Ricochet, or somebody like the Velveteen Dream, or Tommaso Ciampa in this Rumble match, especially since they'll be part of that six-man tag that's going to be on Halftime Heat next Sunday on the network. Fine, I get that. A totally legit complaint. Complaining about Nia Jax being in the ring with men and holding her own for a couple of minutes and then taking a little bit of abuse. It's funny how these same fucksticks didn't say shit. They didn't say shit when Rousey was throwing around fucking Hunter last year at Mania. Well, it was good you didn't strike back. Okay, where's the equality here? If she can throw down, he should be able to respond, period. And if you don't like that, you kiss my ass. Don't like Nia Jax in the Rumble because you felt like there were better uses for the position. It's perfectly fine and acceptable to me. Not liking it because you think it's ridiculous in this day and age that we would have her in the ring where she's getting abused by men. She was abusing people first. Give me a fucking break. Unbelievable. What was also unbelievable to me, but maybe not that surprising, was how flat the finish to this men's Royal Rumble match felt. Like... 
It's Braun Strowman and Seth Rollins. It's already not all that unpredictable. This finish just stunk. And even with Seth Rollins, you can make an argument, maybe deserved it, maybe he didn't, ends up finally having his moment. The crowd, and you can blame it on fatigue to a certain degree, sure, but that's not all of it. The crowd did not pop. They did not nut. This was one of these instances where you went too long, you got to some pre-cum once or twice, and then you kind of blue-balled yourself, and then when you finally nutted, you felt like it was just a waste of time and you wish you had your hour back. That's what this was. And what was really striking to me as I was watching this whole Men's Royal Rumble match was just the utter lack of star power. Seth Rollins winning is fine, I guess. Doesn't move the needle for me one way or another. You're going to have him go on and face Brock Lesnar. Eh, whatever. It just is what it is at this point. Like, it's, it's at that point where it doesn't elicit really happy emotions out of me, but it also doesn't elicit real negative, shitty hate emotions out of me. It just kind of is. And, and as you're watching this Royal Rumble, and it's just, it feels like a bunch of ham and eggers, a bunch of, fucking bunch of jabronis, yes, including some of your fucking NXT gods. It just was a reminder of how far wrestling's really come, and not in a good way. So I know there were a lot of people that were talking about throughout the night on social media that this show was good or really good, and they thought it was great. I can't say that. There was some good stuff on this show, and I talked about it on this review. If you go back and look, yes, I did. But the show was just way too goddamn long. The lack of true star power was very striking on this night. And frankly, both of the Rumble matches stunk. They were long and they were bad. And frankly, a lot of people are just going to like this show because Becky Lynch and Seth Rollins won the Rumbles. If that's how you feel, cool, but that's a pretty superficial and shallow kind of way to look at this. I like to have a little bit of higher standards. Now, surely I have seen far worse Royal Rumble shows and frankly, far worse Rumble matches over the years. But this is a show, for the most part, that I will likely forget very soon. And not exactly the type of show overall that I was expecting to need to want to get to get me a little amped up for this year's Road to WrestleMania. Didn't do that at all.